Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Also, just a quick note that submissions for the Zibby Awards are open and will close on September 15th. Go to zibbyowens.com and you will find the Zibby Awards open submissions where we celebrate all the under-celebrated parts of a book, like the best spine, the best author's note, the best table of contents. And authors can nominate their own best publicists, best editors, and so on. There will be an in-person award ceremony in October in New York. You will not want to miss it go to zibbyowens.com. Michael Frank is the author of 100 Saturdays, Stella Levy and the Search for a Lost World. Michael's essays, articles, and short stories have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, Slate, the Yale Review, Sal Magundi, the TLS, and Tablet, among other publications. His fiction has been presented at Symphony Space's Selected Shorts, a celebration of the short story, and his travel writing has been collected in Italy, the best travel writing from the New York Times. He served as a contributing writer to the Los Angeles Times Book Review for nearly 10 years. A recipient of a 2020 Guggenheim Fellowship, he lives with his family in New York City and Liguria, Italy. He is also the author of a novel called What is Missing, which actually my husband Kyle and his team at Morning Moon Productions optioned for film. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for coming back on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books for the second time, last time for What is Missing, and now for 100 Saturdays in Search of a Lost World. Thank you for having me, Zibby. <laughs> You're the best. Actually, the subtitle should be Stella Levy and the Search for a Lost World. That was an earlier version that went out. Because oh, of sorry. Course, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's publishing complexities, but it is very much the story of Stella and the quest for this lost world of Jewish roads. Very true. Although I'm reading it and I'm like, what is missing? A lost world. Uh, I feel yeah, like exactly. you're, you're, you're on the hunt for something. I don't know. I am. That's funny. I didn't, I'm not, of course, I'd leave it to you to put that together. Yes. And the next book will be about more lost lives and lost people and lost stories. So the, yeah, maybe that's my destiny. I don't know. What is the next book? I know we're jumping ahead here. No, but. I, you know, it's too early to say, but it, it's about, it's, you know, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I spent seven years listening to Stella just as, as an overview. She's one of the probably the handful of uh, people still alive today who was born and grew up in the Jewish community of the island of Rhodes, which was an Italian colonial possession from 1923 officially through World War II. And she lived this amazing life in this amazing place with a horrible centerpiece when the entire community was deported in July of 1944 to Auschwitz. And I went to ask her a question one day at her apartment And went back the next week and then the next. And then the next thing I knew, almost without realizing it, six years had gone by. And I listened to her tell me the story of her remarkable life. And when I finished, I thought, why did I do this exactly? Because she's not my (laughs) grandmother. I'm not from Rhodes. I'm not a Sephardic Jew. And then it made me think, oh, I need to do this, you know, with some similar acuity for some of the people in in my own life. And that, that will be the the next, next project. Oh, uh, but, but we're here today to talk about Stella. So we'll okay. stay to Stella. Okay. We'll stay, we'll stay to Stella. Yeah. I was, I was waiting for some, some giveaway title, but yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So Stella's experience, I, first of all, I can't believe how well you were able to capture it. And really, I felt like you transported me into that time and place, which is what the most successful book books do, right? It's, it, they they pick you up and drop you into another completely different life. And so not only do we live through the horrors, but that's only a, a piece of it. Because first you show us in great detail, as she told you, about her whole life and her siblings, her father. And you also sort of weave in all of the slow but steady changes that are coming, which for her 
she wasn't as aware that they were following a pattern, just like we are not aware when things happen to us until after the fact. And, and she said several times, you know, well, you're saying that from now, Michael, right? She kept yeah, exactly, trying. exactly. Yeah, so the book, in a little, in a, in a small way, or maybe in a medium-sized way, also s- seeks to uh, show the process of capturing somebody's story. You know, I liken Stella at one point to sh- a modern-day Scheherazade, mm-hmm. and that's because of her very uncanny, or maybe clever and sly way of leaving me hanging from week to week and month to month and year to year, and which resulted in this remarkable relationship between the two of us as well. But it's funny, I heard you say the word slow, and I, I come to think about this book like the, the, the writing equivalent of, of a slow food, right? It's like a slow book because it was slow to, for me to come to understand that it was a book, then it was a slow book to research, it was a slow story to listen to, and it was a slow book to write, too. I don't think it's slow to read because it's not that long, and it's broken into 100 chapters, one for each Saturday, a sort of reconstitution of what our experience was. But I think to honor the life of a human being who's nearly 100 years old and who was born in a world that was so far away from ours, and it's so definitively ended in July of 1944, no one, no, no one from almost no one from the Judea, the neighborhood they grew up in, went back to live there after the war, which is just a mind boggling thing to wrap your mind around, you know, that you've had this incredible life. I sometimes describe it as like the Malibu of Greece because they were beach bums, these kids. And well, yes, they grew up in a fairly religious ambiance. That was more for the parents and the grandparents. They, they were close to their traditions, but they were seduced away from them by the arrival of the Italians who brought music and food and movies and Freud and Proust, all these things I describe in the book, and, and romance and friendship and wider ways to imagine your future, like going to university in Europe and having a, a professional life even maybe, which no women in the Judea did, of course. And just the, the leaps and the intensity and of change, as you point out, and of the span of time that she saw into and lived as a young woman is not something you can just gather in a net and, and quickly understand. So I think in a way it turned out retrospectively to be appropriate to, to have spent this much time of my life listening to her and, and trying to capture her experience. Well, it's like a living history. I mean, exactly. Yeah. And one thing I've noticed, it's funny, the book is just starting to be read by people, but it seems to appeal to a lot of younger people, which is surprising to me when the protagonist, so-called, is going to be 100 years old next May. But I think people are seeing in, in it something they wish they had done or something they wish they could do or something they feel they should do, which is capture the story of the people around us, the people around them who are older And at the end of their lives before it's too late, something I only partially personally was able to do with my grandmothers who died when I was 10 and 14. I was alert to things, but, you know, I didn't ask basic questions like, where did you go to school and what did you eat for dinner and who who were your friends? And it's like the micro details, I think, that end up accruing into the faceted portrait that I hope I was able to tell of Stella. Well, I bet they're also interested. So much of the book happened when she was young. Right. I mean, it was her story, even when she was going through the camps and her story of perseverance and being with her sister and how the two of them kind of banded together to, to make it through life, both during and after. And yeah. it, it's a it's a young person's tale, really. I mean, if this was a movie, this would you would need a star who was like no more than 22, right? 20? That, that would only be in the first year of the multi-year TV series, actually, Zivy, because I okay, think in okay. a sense, I think it's funny, I think of, I really do think of uh, Stella in a certain way as a, a variation on the Elena Ferrante heroine, you know, mm-hmm. that she's a young woman in both of and in opposition to the world she was born and grew up in. Yep. And that's always fascinating because uh, women, the expectations of women were not very high. You know, they mm-hmm. were starting their trousseaus mm-hmm. at 10 and they were married by a matchmaker by 16 as her older sisters, except for the intellectual and rebel were. But here it comes Stella with a very different attitude and openness, a curiosity and ambitiousness, no interest in embroidery whatsoever or cooking or any of the things that were expected of her. And so it's an interesting window, I think, in because the choices that she made or the things she refused to do show you what the traditional world and possibilities were. But then there's Stella trying to figure out her own path. And, you know, it's 
impossible to disentangle or say why one person survived the camp experience and the other not. And Stella has a good deal to say about this. Part of me wants to say that it has something to do with the way she was wired as a human being, being courageous, but it's not just that having pluck, you know, not listening to the rules all the time, yet knowing when to listen to the rules. Mm -hmm. But all of those kinds of speculations, I think, are meaningless, as she often points out, you know, she could have been all of those things and then simply not succeeded. And she succeeded because she was lucky, basically. I mean, I feel like her closest call is when she was in the infirmary for whatever that was called, not dysentery, but whatever that she got from going out of, yeah, from being out in the rain. At night, yeah. And they sent her back to the barracks, but then everybody in the infirmary was sent to the gas chambers that exactly. day. I mean, they that sent was... her back. Exactly. <laughs> but that was a, it's a perfect example because she was, she was, a, it was a Jewish Dutch, I think Dutch or yeah, Dutch or Belgian physician, a woman with glasses. Estelle remembered her who said, this one can't stay here. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a collection of micro moments like that in which you okay. could have just turned the other direction and that would have been the end of your life. And, it's very problematic to try to understand, you know, what went on in that place. I think really all you could do is say, this is what happened to me, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and to be careful of, you know, conversations around nobility or, or morality. You know, as Stella said, Stella said, within the arc of a week, they became crooks themselves. Mm-hmm. They stole things. They traded things. They made enemies. They, you know, bonded strongly with some people and not with others. Yep. You know, you know one thing, and I've read a lot of stories as most Jewish people have at some point, but I've read many Holocaust and non-Jewish people, but I happen to have read many takes on the Holocaust and survivor stories and all of that. But this one was different and that Stella was so aware of how she almost left her body, right? She's saying the old Stella it just wasn't there. Like at some point she just kind of put this curtain down and she operated and she existed and she got through each day. And I feel like that was exhibited so clearly when she said that while there, she didn't cry, right? Nobody was weeping while they were there. They were like almost, they were treated like animals, like not even human beings. And almost as a side effect, they like their emotions also, like to get through, they had to put on such an armor that it wasn't until afterwards that she and her sister and others could weep in, in sort of relief and that she could feel coming sort of back into her body once the Americans rescued, freed the camps. I mean, it was such a yeah. clear portrait of like what defense mechanisms you have to employ to get through the most dis- terrible parts of your life. It, it's beautifully put. And, you know, it's what one person did, right? Every, yes. Everybody did something different, I think. But this is what Stella did. And it's not like she was a choice. You know, I think even when, when one writes it, one has to be careful about even the verb choice. It's not like she woke up and said, I'm going to choose to detach no, from the no. Stella Rhodes. You know, she herself, I think, spent decades trying to figure it out. Because wouldn't you? I mean, mm-hmm. I think I would. I don't know what else I'd think about it for certain intervals of my life. It's like, well, how did that happen? How did I make those choices? How, how did I not give in, you know, mm-hmm. why was, why did I have all these moments of luck and my, my best friend from next door, there are yep. all kinds of examples in the book didn't, you know, yep. and, and, and I think this is the other thing about Stella a little bit that sets her story apart. Although I think everyone who's lived that experience and tells her story has something to offer us probably, but she didn't want to be that person, as she puts it, you know, a storyteller of the show. She didn't see herself as a victim. She didn't want to define her, her post-war life through this one year, Mm -hmm. transformative, of course, though it was. And I think that's one of the reasons why, until she was in her early 90s, she didn't fully tell her story. And I I find that fascinating and in a way admirable of her. And that's too much of a judgment. I just find it interesting. It was an Mm -hmm. interesting choice. But it made also for a kind of freshness in her storytelling. She'd never you know, she had not that often told these stories. It's never true that it's not never. But I really, I at least had the feeling that I was hearing them for the first time, at least put together in this way. Yeah. It also made it much more interesting that it was told to you and that you are like the stand in for us. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I haven't thought about it that way. It, I mean, you're the first podcast and the first interview I've done. I'm so excited oh, about that. And so I'm, <laughs> except for some written things. And so, yeah, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that. That I, as the listener, am a stand-in for the reader. Yeah. yeah. And 
I'm very clear also that this is someone else could come along and write another book about Stella. You know, this is me. I'm using what I am, what I've read, what I've lived, the way I'm wired to listen to her. And that, of course, and then to write about her. And don't forget, all of our conversations were in Italian. So we're at several removes from what is on the page. To get there, there are, are, are different iterations of Stella, let's call them, you know. And I think that I think that's true of Everyone thinks that's true always of fiction, but strangely, it's quite true of nonfiction as well, that you, what is this, what is true in what you are offering? Yes, Stella's story is true, but it's very much seen through lots of layers of filters, which are inevitable in a book like this, you know? Yeah, but I think that only, that's a, a positive. I mean, this could have been, if this was just a story, if it was written like you could have done it where you wrote in her voice as like almost a ghostwriter right. or you could have made it like a biography, but right. you made it about the relationship and the teasing out of information over time. And so, right. yeah. Right. Because I'm, I'm, look, I'm not a historian. I'm not a biographer. I'm not interested in writing that, those kinds <laughs> right. of books. Right. I am no. a writer who writes stories that come to me, however they come to me, whether they're my family stories in the first book or through imagination based on some experience, say in the novel or, or this book, that I didn't even know was a book. You know, I was just simply I going about my daily life, so to speak. And suddenly there is this unavoidable story that I felt had to, I had to tell, you know? Yeah. It's strange. I was surprised hearing about Stella's lack, not lack of ability. That sounds judgmental as well, but her, her difficult time being a mother herself. It seemed like from the outside, at least, she was able to reintegrate into regular society, so to speak, right? She could figure out where to be, and she tried L.A., and then went to New York, and, you know, got into a relationship. You know, she, she ticked off the, the things that made her seem like she was back in, and I felt like this was a waving red flag, like what, what was not processed and all of that for when she had a son, and ultimately sent him away. Although, of course, I sent my kid to boarding school. It doesn't mean I have deep-seated issues. But, you know, it just seemed like a little more dramatic. Right, right. And I mean, but see, there you go. In a certain way, you you take you you have a reason for look, or you have a piece of information that you can apply to that choice of hers that, you know, you made the same cho- a similar choice, right? right? So I, I just, I, I don't feel super comfortable speaking to her mother. And I think that's been quite painful for her, but she has, a, what I can, from what I can tell, a good relationship with her son today. And, you know, they care for each other very deeply, but a lot of things came to her with difficulty, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, how much do you attribute to this experience? Everything, nothing, some, it's very, it's hard to know. You know, she was formed, she was a formed young woman when she went to Auschwitz. But I also try to imagine, and I honestly, I quite, I can't. I just can't what it means to get off a train. And that's the end of your family. As you know, it. it's the end of your friends. It's nearly all of them. It's the end of your aunts and uncles. It's the end of the entire world that you feel you owned, you know, mm-hmm. owned in the deepest emotional sense. And she often, she has this phrase that one of the first things she said to me that she thought of Rhodes as she and the community thought of Rhodes as their own little piece of the earth. Well, of course you would. You've lived there as a, a community for half a millennium, right? I mean, you've seen all kinds of different rulers come and go. And then just by the twist of the political dial. Yeah. Yeah. And even she, you know, repeatedly said like, well, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, like, why would they take us across the world when they could have just killed us here if that's what they wanted to do? Why take 1,650 people and put them on boats and trains and, and go on like the longest recorded journey to extinction when... Exactly. Like, I mean, what, I, heard one, I heard one of the leading scholars of the, of the Shoah, the Holocaust in Italy say Rhodes was is the example of the extreme absurdity of the entire thing because it yeah. made no sense strategically economically politically they were already losing the war if they didn't admit it or know it but the allies were in nearly in florence when they d- deport these people and uh, i just don't, i mean there are many many people have many ideas about why you build a machinery to that degree it has to keep moving you you know you're not willing to concede that you've lost you yeah yeah, it's, it's still, as Stella points out, just murder, sh- shoot us all and bury us on the land that we belong to, for goodness sake, you know. and Because yeah. that would have been great, you know. Yeah, yeah, that would have been great. Well, that certainly <laughs> happened enough in other places in Europe and elsewhere in the world. So what was it like for you going to Rhodes 
with all of this information and like I I've been trying to put myself in your shoes of feeling all that history and knowing what happened and and even Stella shoes. Tell me about that. Yeah. I, well, the truth is that I went to Rhodes in 2015 when I had just begun talking to Stella. So unfortunately, I think it could come later. And we, we, I had started to put together a plan just as for the year of COVID to go back with her, which would have been the perfect way for me, to, I think, to ultimately metabolize this information and for both of us to kind of finish this project like that. And it didn't happen. But even so, it was a most fascinating experience because the Judea of today, you look at it through one set of eyes and you see stupid souvenir shops and T-shirt dealers and restaurants, right? And then you see it through another set of eyes, meaning the storyteller's eyes. And you see all of that like as an effect in a movie or a dream really disappearing. And through Stella's narration and her memories, which many of which at that, that point she'd begun to share with me, you saw that this is where the cobbler was, the tailor. This is where they sat and gossiped on the stairs. This is the oven, the communal oven. I mean, imagine being alive today and still having taken your dishes to bake in a communal oven. This is the Turkish bath. This was the synagogue. This is where I first was kissed. You know, it, 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 it was this strange bifurcated experience of being there and seeing the 2015 roads but also being there and feeling and seeing, you know, 1940, 1935, 1925 roads. And it was an, uh, it was haunting that experience, you know, and I just I'm more haunted by the fact that I that I can't go back. But also, as I'm a stand in for the reader, I had to imagine it and capture it in language. And so I became Stella's listener. And that was my way of traveling to roads, ultimately. One other thing that's so unique about the book are Myra Coleman's beautiful illustrations sprinkled throughout and the cover, yes, of course, but also these beautiful images that are sprinkled through. Why illustrate at all? That's a great question. I felt that, I mean, the obvious choice, of course, would be photographs. First, you'd have to ask, well, how are there photographs of this, you know, deported community? And the answer to that is that, and, and how were there even photographs on which Myra could base some of these paintings? is that the older siblings had been leaving the island through the 20s and earlier. And so they took photographs with them, as you would, to remember home. So that's why there are photographs. And they're quite amazing, too, a number of them. But I felt, and this is all going back to something you said earlier about my being a stand-in for the reader. And, and as I say, that I'm at a certain remove from this story and had to reimagine it for myself, both first going, listening to it in one language and writing, translating and writing it to another, but also having to find a way to tell stories, Stella's story as a story, and not just these conversations that we had over all these years. And so I thought that illustrations do a similar thing. They aren't literal depictions of a reality, but they are the interpretation of, in this case, the painter, Myra Kalman. And it, it just felt like a natural thing, a natural direction to go in. Myra also had heard the story, had heard about Stella's story and offered to paint them for us. And, and, and I thought, great, you know, and this is one of the thing that the paintings do that I think maybe the book doesn't entirely succeed in doing, because how could it? Which is, you know, what I call that Malibu of, you know, Malibu of the Eastern Aegean, this very lush, aromatic, central place that Stella grew up, a place of color and aromas and water and sunlight are in a way easier to depict when you can paint them, right? Than when you say, oh, the sea was blue and the flowers are pink and they smell good or in theory, one would do a little bit better than that. But there's something very immediate in Myra's illustrations, I think, that helped take us back and remind us that, wow, this was a, a kind of paradise, you know, all the more heartbreaking to have people taken away from it. So. I think I'm going to go and do a Google image search after this for <laughs> images. Well, and I, see. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I just, I just did a little interview myself with Myra and I, I'm going to write a little piece. I'm just trying to figure about, figure out about it, how to do it. But I thought it would be interesting to show the photographs alongside that inspired her to show them alongside the, the finished paintings. And you can see those sort of classic Myra liberties with more color, bigger bows, you know, <laughs> juicier slices of cake, If you know? Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, congratulations on 100 Saturdays for 
not only like immersing me as a reader in the experience and the community, but teaching some history quietly, subtly along the way about the different periods of sort of invasion or whatever, not invasion, but when you like ownership of the different of the territory and the history yeah. behind it and, yeah. uh, and the war really. And, and this is how history gets passed down. It's through stories about one person and exactly it's, you know, it Walter, Walter Benjamin choice. has this wonderful uh, quote in which he talks about the power of the oral tale mm -hmm. and how it passes on tradition more powerfully than the written story mm -hmm. in some degree. And when you think about it, it is like, you know, I tried to do in this book, the, uh, some rough equivalent of that, sitting in the around the campfire or sitting at the foot of your grandparents or sitting out in the garden and and listening as a child or a young person or an older person but listening to the story of another human being's life it's and, and very she, powerful and she said it kept her alive which is so wonderful. yeah yeah i mean it's just really it's just gave me the chills it's wonderful thank you zibby thank you for this wonderful conversation you're the best thank you all right bye michael bye <laughs> take care bye Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 